Welcome to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. For each week, we speak with brands, icons, innovators, and trailblazers within the fly fishing industry, exploring both the successes and failures they've encountered along the way to become who they are today. But first, if you have not yet subscribed to the podcast or joined our email list, please do so by going to the Fly Fisher Insider Podcast.com, or you can also find us on Instagram at Fly Fisher Insider Podcast. Now let's begin. Welcome to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. Today, our guest is Sasha Clark Danilchuk. She is the Executive Director for the Keep Fish Wet. Sasha's here today to tell us more about the organization, what they're doing, their mission, and their goal. Sasha, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Greg. Yeah, no worries. Hopefully, uh, you're staying safe out where you are. Where are you, by the way? I'm in Western Massachusetts, so uh, I usually explain that as not Boston, part of Massachusetts. <laughs> for all of us Canadians that we're wondering, for sure. You there know, you go. <laughs> it's funny. So Sasha, you know, I want to get into all the fantastic stuff that you guys are doing, but before uh, before we do that, just tell us a bit about yourself, how you got into fly fishing, um, and, and sort of what led you into where, where you're at right now. Yeah, so, um, gosh, probably like a lot of people in this sport, you know, it kind of came from childhood influences um my my father loves the mountains and hiking and backpacking and my mother loves the beach so all of our vacations were were one or the other growing up um and I fished as a kid um most uh, initially you know kind of just conventional spin here And then when I was maybe in middle school, um, I have an older cousin who's kind of like a a big brother to me. And um, he introduced my siblings and I to fly fishing. And admittedly, you know, I was, it didn't really take to begin with. um, But my brother got really, really into it in in high school in particular. Um, And I tried it a little bit and, and it was all right. But, uh, but then when I was in college, I did a semester abroad in the Caribbean, and I got to go out and watch somebody wade bonefish flats and, and catch bonefish. And, uh, you know, being out on a sandy flat that's, you know, ankle deep water that you can wade and see these fish come across, that's what really did it for me. And I was like, I have to learn how to do this. So... Um, I actually, after I graduated from college, went back and worked for the for the program. And my brother, who at that time was was uh, wanting to learn how to build rods, built me um, built me a rod. It uh, it cast like a two by four, but uh, <laughs> it was a good thing to learn on. Um, and I taught myself to tie flies and and to cast and and catch bone fish. So. Um, it was really that saltwater experience that, that got me hooked for sure. So being in Massachusetts, do you, and I, hopefully I'm saying that right. Yeah. Do you, do you prefer like just doing destinations like going bone fishing, like down, down South or like, are you a multi-species fisherman? You know, I mean, definitely multi-species now, you know, that's changed and evolved over the years. Although I did end up spending about 10 years in the Caribbean, uh, mostly Turks and Caicos Islands and the Bahamas. So I got a fair amount of flat fishing in, um, and I still love it. I mean, being on a bonefish flat is, is still my my happy place for sure. But yeah, not so many bonefish up here in Western Mass. <laughs> so, you know, I end up doing a lot of a lot of trout fishing in the summer when it gets really hot, you know, um, bass fishing and things like that as well. So. Awesome. I love that. So, so then Sasha, here's where we're going to go. Then when did you lead into the role? Like after, after that program was done, you came back. Is that when you, you got into the role that you're at right now as the executive dress director? Uh, no. So, um, so it did, it did take me in the direction of fishery science. Um, and, you know, as I'd mentioned, I spent, uh, 
almost 10 years in the Bahamas, um, teaching and working for a couple different organizations um, and kind of helping build a, a research institute that was all focused on kind of uh, marine and, and Bahamian science. And um, yeah, so my background's really in fishery science. Did that for a while. Also kind of worked for some nonprofits. Um, and, you know, didn't want to go into academia um, and so, you know, it took me a while to kind of figure out exactly what I wanted to do when I grew up. I'm still not entirely sure, but, um, but, uh, eventually it led me to, you know, realizing that as a scientist, you know, there was all this information that was being produced and, you know, that came from the science and it was really relevant for anglers and as an angler realizing that, um, you know, anglers don't have access to a lot of the science that's done. You know, it's, it's written in this kind of complicated jargony language and scientific articles are usually locked behind paywalls. So they're not even necessarily accessible to anglers um, and realizing that there, there needed to be uh better flow of communication both ways, right, between the science and angling communities. And um, I initially started out, you know, back, we, so we just rebranded. We used to be Keep Them Wet Fishing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I initially started writing a, a blog series, um, and essentially that's what I was doing. I was translating the science, um, you know, taking a 10-page article and making it into, you know, a couple paragraphs and some bullet points that were easily understood and picking out the relevant information for anglers. Um, and then my work kind of just grew and grew and I started doing more and more for the organization. And uh, we formed a nonprofit uh, last year. And so part of that was I, I took on the executive director role. So, um yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. Sort of so, where I got to where I am, <laughs> which is which is great, and I'm glad you clarified that because you know I know like like you said like anglers don't have access to a lot of the um, articles or d facts or data or studies that were were done, and you know as I like to say it like this like we're as anglers we're front, we're on the front line right we're the ones that are handling fish and we're you know we're we're active and we're doing our our part in that but i mean not having all the information it could be you know in one sense detrimental so the fact that you went out of your way and created that access for everybody to have that awareness is fantastic and it's such a great idea do you know what i mean um you know in in your blog. yeah yeah like your blogs i'm assuming now now um with your blogs that you have, have i don't want to say dumbed down but like um translated is that a better word Tr translated it into more exactly user friendly um you know user friendly material like i i would probably be bored and lose interest or fall off uh reading a scientific <laughs> study on on you know what i mean like on on fish um yeah but, you know yeah, and there's a reason, I mean, there's, you know, there's really good reasoning why science is written the way that it is, you know, scientists work really hard to try to be as objective as possible, you know, obviously we're human beings, so we can't ever be completely objective, um, and so there's, but there's good reason why, you know, science is written in the third person, and, and you know, the methodology is explained down to a T, so that if somebody wanted to wrap um, excuse me, replicate the experiment they could, um, you know, and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, it's really hard to get through. I mean, it'll take, you know, it takes me a long time to read a study and really dissect it. And um, so, you know, trying to ask anglers to do that is, it's a lot. And I know anglers who do and they love it, but uh, it's not for everyone. Um, and so, you know, finding another way to communicate that information, and you're exactly right, like, you don't, it doesn't need to be dumbed down. That's not, that's not the point. It mm -hmm. just needs to be, you know, put into a different language, uh, the, the salient pieces pulled out. I mean, that's the other thing, like, 
it's easy to read a study and, you know, especially in the discussion section, which is kind of a summary and, and wraps things up and pulls out the conclusions. There isn't necessarily like different weights given to different types of conc- the conclusions always. So sometimes it's really complicated to read through it and figure out like, okay, what is the key point that I need to take away from this study or that the angling community should take away? Um, you know, and some things just, some things are more scientifically, um, I don't want to say significant because that's a, that's a, that has its own scientific <laughs> definition, but, um, you know, uh, poignant and yeah. And, and, but, but it might be the more minor points that even aren't discussed as much that have more relevance. Um, to, to anglers. So, you know, I think trying to get that information and in a form that anglers can use, especially with something like fishery science, which is so applicable, right? This isn't, you know, there's a, there's a ton. I mean, we have over 400 studies on catch and release now. And so, you know, there's a ton of information out there that could be used by anglers Um, and it's just a matter of are they getting getting the information out there are they using it that's the question too so that is a good question well that's our goal um you know one of our big goals is is to um make that information accessible so that it can be used Mm -hmm. and and help anglers um get better at using some of that information what so I'm going to speak in the third person here for me. Um, or <clears throat> can you explain to me um, what the importance of and why we should keep fish wet? Like what's, you know, um, for those, I'll just say for, for, again, for me, it just makes it more easier that way. Um, yeah. Explain to me why we want to do that sure. and the importance of it. Yeah. So, and, and if I can, I'll just, um, I'll broaden that out a little bit and I'll say, you know, why anglers should use best practices in general yeah. as opposed to specifically keeping fish wet, which we can get into more detail soon if you want to as well. But anytime, so. yeah, I mean, <laughs> okay. um, you know, so um, I, I don't, you know, get, Catch and release as a practice has been around for a really long time, right? I think there, there's a Lee Wolf quote that I think it's all the way back in the 1930s or something that says, game fish are too valuable to be caught only once. So this idea that we're not harvesting every single fish that we catch has been around for a really long time and even way, you know, way prior to that quote. Um, and... You know, it's not it's not complex to wrap your head around. You know, putting some fish back means that some of them live to be caught again another day. Um, but a lot of the the science um, kind of came after catch and release was put in place um, as a conservation tactic, and either voluntarily, right, anglers chose to practice catch and release because they didn't need to or want to eat all the fish that they were catching or, you know, in some place it's, it's regulatory too, right? There are certain rivers or times of year or, or stretches um, that you have to release fish. Um, So a lot of the science of catch and release has been done in the last 30 years. And actually about half the studies have been done in the last decade alone. Um, And more and more, what they're showing is that, you know, A, not all fish survive, and B, there are things that anglers can do that influence whether a fish survives or not, Mm -hmm. and just in general, the health of that fish after release. So, um, you know, there's a really good argument that we need, that practicing catch and release is not good enough that there's more that we can and probably should be doing. Um, you know, not, <laughs> I don't want to get to the numbers too deeply because um, it's especially hard uh, through a podcast when you can't see them, or at least for me, I think it's always easier to, to look at them. But, you know, we, in the U.S., um, 
we catch about 350 million fish every year, and, and over half of those, about 57%, are released. And I think in Canada, release rates are even higher. Um, you know, some agencies estimate about a 10% mortality of fish. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously that's going to vary with species. It's going to vary with how you're catching the fish. But if, you know, if you figure in the U.S. Um, that over half of those fish are, are being released and about 10% are, are dying after release, that's 20 million fish a year to die from catch and release. Um, and, and it's really easy to bring those numbers down, right? If, if, if you can change release mortality rates mm-hmm. from 10% to 9%, you're saving 2 million fish a year. Yeah, that's, that's and then huge. think about, you yeah. know, yeah, the huge. economics of that, right? Yeah. Like how much money are those 2 million fish worth? that you're yeah. saving. Um, so I think there's an ec- economic argument to be made, you know, and then if you're talking about fisheries that are already threatened or, or vulnerable, um, you know, at some point, every single one of those fish matters to the population. Mm-hmm. So the more that we can do um, to give the fish we release a better chance of survival, the the more resilient our populations are going to become. Um, and, and that's especially important, you know, when you're thinking about all the different impacts that fisheries have today, right? Whether it's climate change or habitat loss, if we can just take pressure off, a little bit of pressure off from one of these impacts, it just, it creates more resiliency. So those fisheries are, are more likely to, around for longer right yeah. that our kids and grandkids will have a, a better chance of experiencing that um so really you know that's kind of the the basis of you know the philosophy i guess behind keep fish wet um and then we can do these things without taking the enjoyment out of fishing so then that's that's where i'm going to go with that right now um what are some yeah. of the ways right now that anglers or myself um can can reduce that mortality rate and inc- and get the you know save two million fish. How how can we do that? Sure. How, yeah, yeah. So um, we have you know essentially combed through all the science and um, pulled out you know the best practices, the things that anglers can do, and and organized them really into three simple principles. And these are things that every angler can do, no matter, you know, what type of fishing, no matter what type of water body, what type of species, anywhere in the world. And they're, and they're, they don't require you to buy a lot of new equipment, um, although I'm a gear junkie, so I love any excuse <laughs> there is to buy new gear. But, um, but, you know, these are things that beginning anglers can use, there are things that expert anglers can use. And, they're, and most importantly, these are things that are within an angler's control, right? There, there are reasons that, um, you know, that we can't change the outcome of fish, um, such as deep hooking, right? We don't always have control exactly where a fish is hooked. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are a bunch of things that we can control about an angling experience. Um, so we use three principles. Uh, the first one, not surprisingly, has to do with air exposure. So it's just to to minimize air exposure. Um, and most studies out there for most species say that, say that, you know, 10 seconds or less is okay. So if you can keep air exposure under 10 seconds, that's going to give um, any fish a much better chance of survival. Um, so that's kind of the, yeah. the biggest one um, and, and, our, and our first principle. Um, our, our second principle is to eliminate contact with dry surfaces. So fish are covered in slime or, or mucus and, and that helps protect them kind of the way our skin protects us. So anything that you can do to keep that mucus layer intact, um, is going to be beneficial. Fish are really susceptible to, once they lose their mucus, they're really susceptible to like disease and, mm-hmm. um, 
in particular fungal infections. So, you know, that's, that's just getting your hands wet before you handle a fish. Don't drag it up on the bank. Um, you know, try to keep it off the rocks, things like that. And then our, our third principle is to reduce handling time. And that's anything that you're doing to a fish from landing to release, you know, whether it's actually in your hands or in a net. If you can get that period um, as short as possible, um, it's going to give fish, uh, fish are going to do better after release as well. Absolutely. So. Yeah, absolutely. Three great practices for sure. Now, when you like, and this is where I kind of want to go with this. Everyone knows your hashtag, keep fish wet. Everyone's probably used it. I'm guilty of using it. And uh, I, I talked to you about this briefly. And it's, you're, you're hashtagging that. And in those, when you see those photos or you, you see that, like, is there a misconception of keeping fish wet when people are like mishandling or, or, or not um, following the those three three um, minimizing contacts that you mentioned just mentioned like yeah i mean i i have to admit i guess i sort of have a love hate relationship with uh social media and hashtags in general um you know they're really helpful for getting ideas across but um you know, the keep them wet hashtag in particular, you know, gains a lot of popularity and that's really great. But then it also gets used for a lot of other stuff that um, isn't necessarily trying to convey ideas about fish handling in mm-hmm. particular, right? So, you know, if you if you search, uh, you know, on Instagram, keep them wet, I'm sure 80% of those pictures are of, fish out of water, um, you know, handled in ways that aren't necessarily following our principles. So, um, you know, we, in, in a lot of ways, I mean, it's, it's great to convey ideas, um, but we also want to be realistic, right? Like, you know, yes, you can still get a, a, a photo of a fish in less than 10 seconds, yes. right? Even if you have to lift it out of the water, you know, that's, that's possible. You can get great photos of fish, mm-hmm. you know, if they're out of the water for less than 10 seconds. Um, and there are situations where it's really hard to, um, to, to never take a fish out of the water. You know, I was fishing yesterday from, from a boat with fairly high sides and, you know, some of the fish we were landing, I just couldn't, I was going to fall overboard <laughs> if I, by trying to lean all the way down to the water. So, um, you know, so some of those fish had, had to come out of the water for a few seconds just for me to get the hook out quickly. Mm-hmm. So, so I think we want to be, um, you know, reasonable about our expectations. I mean, people, not everybody has an underwater camera. Not everybody can take really cool split shot photos of fish. Um, so we still, we still want people to enjoy this experience of fishing um, and, and maybe just find ways to amend their actions a little bit so that the fish can be, healthier after release right it's it's a delicate it's kind of a delicate balance um you know and there are fish that are that are that are more tolerant of air exposure than others and there are times when fish are more tolerant of air exposure um for example you know water temperature has a huge impact um on how fish respond to catch and release in general so um so if we were to say yeah. trout, are they? Do they have a longer? You're saying that like like specific species potentially have a, a longer like um, out of water time or air time, as you mentioned. Yeah, I don't think anybody's ever looked um, compared one trout species to the next. That study hasn't hasn't been done, um, but you know we do. The more, the more science we have, we do know that, A, there are species-specific differences, and, t- and B, there are also, like, location-specific differences, right? Okay. Um, yeah. And so, 
um, you know, and, and, and water temperature, as I said, plays into that, right? So, so if the water is 60 degrees or 65 degrees, um, in general, trout are going to be more tolerant of air exposure than they are if it's reaching the upper limits of, of kind of their tolerance of, of water temperature in general, right? So if it's like 68 or 70 degrees, taking a fish out of, out of water for five seconds is going to be um, like be more detrimental than it mm. would be if the water was 65 degrees. So. Cool. Good to yeah. know. Yeah. I def- mean, definitely good to know. Yeah. And, you know, this summer, a lot of places, um, you know, water temperatures have been, have been pretty warm. So mm-hmm. I've, you know, been answering a lot of questions about kind of water temperature and, and what do you do? And that's kind of one of those things that isn't, totally in an angler's control right unless you decide not to fish or or go after something else instead so absolutely so sasha here's i want to shift here i want to shift to which what like going forward what's your ideal vision or goal for you know the organization and what you essentially really want to accomplish um like that that's, that's realistic though um, yeah, so, I mean, our, our goals are really to, um, change the way that, that anglers practice catch and release, kind of catch and release version 2.0, if, if you will. Um, and, you know, using some of these principles, um, which are pretty simple, we have some, some tips that are kind of more specific that we use on our website um, and, and really getting into more types of fishing. I mean, the, the, you know, we kind of started off in, in fly fishing and that's been a really easy, easy fit for us. But, um, you know, fly fishing is a, is a pretty small portion of the recreational fishing industry. So, Correct. you know, expanding into other types of fishing is, is always important too. But, um, yeah, I mean, just working on connecting with anglers. We have a number of kind of education initiatives and outreach initiatives. Um, part of our rebranding was we just launched a new program um, called the Advocate Program, and, and it's a way for anglers to become involved um, and it's essentially just a, a pledge that they take to to use the best okay. practices. How 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 do they go um, about doing that, Sasha? Sorry to jump in, but I want to I want to know how they go about taking that pledge. Yeah, so that's actually on our website. Um, if you go to keepfishwet dot org, um, you'll see there's a um, there's a link to the advocate program, um, and so. That's kind of the the first step is, you know, bringing people in, but that's also a place where where we will offer kind of more education opportunities and more information for for people as well as as that starts to to expand. So, yeah. Which is good, yeah. Um, So you mentioned educational aspects as well. What educational aspects are you guys offering for people? Um, Yeah, I mean, right now... Um, we've got, you know, we do a lot of presentations, a lot of talking to different kind of fishing and angler groups. Um, we do a lot, honestly, through social media. I mean, that's been, we really kind of started out on social media. Um, and so, you know, just, just conveying information through that, that platform, um, is important to us. Um, and then through the website as well, um, you know, that's where kind of that blog series that I initially talked about, um, and it was all through our website. And then we have a couple of, of other things in, in the works as well. Um, kind of a couple more education opportunities, um, that, that we are, that we're working on for anglers. Um, one is kind of some more virtual opportunities, to learn about about best practices, um, kind of through an online platform that we're that we're working on, um, and 
and, and beta testing right now, actually, as well. Um, actually, closer to your neck of the woods up in the Yukon. So, okay. so um, yeah. You have all this these tools. You have all this information. You guys have a, a like a huge social media presence. Um, I want to ask you, like, how are anglers uh, that from the fly fishing community? I know you're trying to expand to to, to general sport anglers. Um, how are anglers re- like receptive to what everything you're doing? Is there any pushback or resistance from anybody or any any specific groups? Or do you get any? Um, challenges you know regarding this or in general are fly fishers like open to it acceptance to it like walk us through what's going on there yeah i mean by and large i think people are are very receptive to these ideas Uh, you know i think also once people realize that we aren't trying to take the fun out of fishing (laughs) um you know that that these are really simple things that that can be done um that that there's no kind of reason not to try some of these things or or use some of these things that they they really don't change the experience um and in some ways they enhance it right because you know that the fish that you release um is going to be in a better condition if if you're using these principles mm-hmm. um you know i would say the the two areas where we um potentially get get pushed back or um you know the message doesn't always go over as well as we'd hope um you know one is um is just realizing that that not everybody uh practices catch and release or um i guess you could say even believes in in catch and release as a practice right um that, you know, there's still a lot of out, people out there that fish for food, and we are not opposed at all to the harvest of, of fish for food. Um, but these principles and tips, you know, are really only applying to fish that are going to be released. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are communities and places where um, people rely on fish for food really heavily, right? So um, they see using catch and release as essentially playing with your dinner um so you know it's not necessarily that they're opposed to us or our ideas but that um more just they're opposed to the practice of catch and release in general um and and that it is fairly privileged right to get to go out there and catch some fish and not need to take it home for dinner um we're pretty lucky to be able to do that because um, not everybody's in that position to, to get to go out and, and enjoy fishing in that manner. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. that's, yeah. yeah. Oh. So that's one. And then, you know, the other is just sort of, a, a I think one of the downsides of social media in general is that, um, it can be hard to have a constructive discussion on social media platforms, right? So, you know, while we make a huge effort to always make sure that our messaging is positive and we're not shaming or calling out anglers, I think sometimes uh, we see that on social media in general, right? Somebody posts a picture of a fish and um, and people jump on over, jump jump all over them, you know, about why isn't that fish in the water? Why aren't you handling it better? And um, those conversations really really aren't very constructive uh, over social media. Yeah, those to those conversations, those conversations, you know, I'm going to chime in here. They don't, they don't yeah. originate from your organization. Usually, it's just from some random person. Right. That is true. You know. It's um, not, yeah, I mean, never, we're not. Yeah, I don't <laughs> see you doing that, Sasha. I mean, let's clarify that right now. That you know, if yeah. I post a picture of me holding a fish and it's out of the water, you guys aren't going to jump onto my page and start shaming me by any means. Um, you've never done that. And I think it's clear, like it's important to point that out. Um, you know what I mean? It's maybe someone else might do that, but you know, that's from what I've seen, that's what I've seen. So. Yeah, correct. I mean, we, we absolutely don't um, believe that that's a constructive way of, 
uh, getting any sort of information across. So um, we don't do that. But, um, I, you know, I think some of the maybe people, it gets conflated, right? People don't understand where, the, where this is coming from. So, um, you know, we using uh, our information to bash other anglers or criticize other anglers um, it isn't something that we want to have done in general. So, yeah. Absolutely. No. Um, what are some facts you can share with us right now just about your whole organization, everything like that, some, some fishing facts, some cool stuff? Um, fishing facts. Um, gosh, let me think about that. Um, I'll, I'll let you think. Do you have a specific topic that you, that you about, want to hear? I'll, I'll go like this. I'll go edit, edit, edit so that I know. And then right now we'll we'll talk. <laughs> so when I say fishy fact, you said you had some stuff for Canada, or some statistics. That's the word. Um, oh. Do you have any? Yeah. We're, um, we're looking for like another... No, if we can get like another like four minutes, um, this will be that'll kind of chop. That'll be good. We'll be at a, a good time. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, some of the statistics I guess I was thinking about were okay. Let you me, know, like let me, numbers. Okay, yeah. So when you're ready with that, I'll re-ask the question. Okay. Um, I, I some of it's some of what I already talked. Okay. Sure. Okay. You want to go back into yeah. that? It's yeah. kind of some of the statistics yeah. no, okay, that's about right. uh, how many fish are caught. Um, let's see. Uh, interesting things that we could talk about. Um, do you want to talk about pouring coke on fish on um, fish's gills to stop bleeding? Yeah. I, Have you seen that you, practice? Yeah. Um, Lewis Cahill and I were talked about that. So um, yeah, I'll bring I'll bring that up. I'll, or do you want to save that? Okay. No, let's bring it up. So I'll. Uh, okay. I'll ask a question on that. So, Sasha, before I let you go, um, you know, I, I heard a rumor, and I know I've talked to Louis Cahill about this, and we did that in, in one of the earlier episodes. He brought it up about, and I know, uh, um, about pouring Coca Cola on a fish's gill to stop the bleeding. He says it cauterizes it. And, um, you know, you being a, a fish scientist, if you will, um, is that true? Yeah. So um, that's what that's that's one of those practices, and and you know that's definitely made its way around the internet. And uh, there were a couple people who kind of you know tested it or, or or tried it, or a lot of people who were trying it, and a couple of people who kind of tried to uh, address it quasi scientifically. Um, but we, we finally have kind of a, a more scientific study that they were just wrapped up, um, actually conducted by one of my, my board members, a, a really a great fishery scientist out of uh, Carleton. And, um, you know, he, he was looking at, he used pike for the study to, mm -hmm. to look at what happened when you poured carbonated beverages um, on on fish gills and you know that for those who who haven't watched any of the videos the theory is that you know if a fish is deeply hooked or um, you know in particular bleeding from the gills that if you pour coke on it right it stops the bleeding um, so so they tested coke and um, just carbonated lake water they used like a soda stream, mm -hmm. right, um, to, to, to see um, if just carbonated lake water made a difference. And then I think they also did Mountain Dew, which is a, another popular uh, beverage in, in some of those videos. Um, and what they found is that it looks like it can stop the bleeding for a few minutes, but in the end, it actually doesn't start stop bleeding um, and it can actually be harmful to the fish, right? So um, what happens is that the carbonation um, can, uh, can create bradycardia, which is, um, you know, a slowing down of, of the heart rate. And so when your heart rate slows, bleeding slows as well. And so it looks like maybe the fish stops bleeding 
But then once you put the fish back in the water, the heart rate increases and bleeding resumes. Um, and they actually had a few fish where they said, you know, it, it would look like it would stop the bleeding for about 30 seconds. But then, quote, blood was spurting from the gills. Um, so I think they actually had a few fish that actually bled out in that study. Um, so it's one of those things that it looks mm -hmm. like it works. And, you know, so not surprising that that uh, some anglers thought it would, was a good idea. But um, in the end, it actually doesn't seem to be helpful at all for fish once they're bleeding. So what can, what, is there any solution or is it just a mortality? Um, it's not necessarily a mortality. It really depends on the degree of the injury. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then things like, is this a fish where there's predators in the environment or not, right? So probably just releasing the fish and um, as long as it can swim away, letting it go is the best thing you can do um, for a fish that's bleeding or, or injured. I love it. The myth is now busted from the science. So <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Um, you know what, Sasha? It's been it's been awesome. I I hope uh, I hope you uh, you you guys do really well. I know you guys are doing well with everything that's going on. Um, I hope uh, our listeners gain some valuable information out of what you've had to say today. That's why I asked you to be a part of the show. I really wanted to support what you're doing and get behind what you guys are doing as well. So on that note, before I do let you go, do you have any last words for anybody? Um, yeah, check out our website. If you want more information about any of the things that we checked and uh, talked about today, uh, there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, you know, some of the more technical sciencey stuff, if you want to dig into that as well. So yeah, thank okay. you. And if people wanted to get behind you guys or support you, where could they find you at? Yep. Uh, www.keepfishwet.org. Um, or we're on Instagram and Facebook at keep dot fish dot wet um, you can awesome. check us out there and, pro and also hashtag keep fish wet um yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty big one there i'm gonna i, I definitely want to thank you guys and I, listeners i want to thank you as well sasha has been a great uh great talking to you i've learned so much and uh i've learned uh, a lot from my practices going forward as well thanks so much this was fun i appreciate it great no worries thanks guys You've been listening to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. If you like this podcast episode, please let us know. Leave a review and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast listening platform.